All right, we're back with Jim Shields. Jim, as you know, this is super meaningful for me, for my family. I came across you, or we met at an event, I think, uh, yep. before I had children. Yeah. And I, I listened to your idea of the family board meetings and 18 summers and read the, I think it was the original copy of the book. I just read the third version of it, but I think I read the original copy of the book way back when, before I had kids, knowing how important it was going to be when I had kids. And now my oldest is six and we've taken our first official board meeting. So I'll tell you about that in a bit, but I want to start with a quote from the beginning of the book. Okay. And this is, this is the beginning of your book. Uh, the family board meeting. I think this is the third version. And it asks, when was the last time you spent a whole day alone with your child with no electronics distractions while enjoying a fun activity and meaningful conversation? It's a big question. It's a big question. That hits a, lot of people don't, a lot of people don't like the answer. I know had I not woken up a decade ago or so, I don't know if I'd like the answer. Because unless you set the intention, it so rarely happens, John, just with the, you know, the whole reason that one of the reasons you're doing this, this whole series is the short bursts of social media and you want to get to a deeper level. And we just forget, we forget how much, you know, certain things are running us over and, and separating us from what you just described. I mean, I've gone in front of some big audiences and people look baffled when I actually ask that question. Really? And, uh, and it, it's all telling the good news is it can be reversed. And, uh, you know, I know I don't have to sell you on that. Once you start to do these and set this intentional quality time, it's an absolute game changer for, for both people involved. So is this anything new or has this changed recently? <laughs> well, really this, so we've had three editions of the book and, and so, you know, Jamie and I always had this dream said with the 18 summers theme, I'd love to one time, Re release the book to a publish with a publisher, a real publisher. Right. Well, tell no me more. what 18 Summers is first. I mean, I know. Yeah, so 18 Summers was taught summers. to me by a mentor of mine. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, the average person will spend about 85% of all the quality time they have with their children by the end of the 18th summer. Yeah. And, uh, and my mentor said, do make the most of those 18 summers, Jim, make the most of them. My, my daughters are still my daughters, but it's different. You do the, you'll never regret that time that you carve out that extra time that you put forward. And if you do the, those first 18 summers, right, they're going to come back for more. You're going to have more quality time with them than average, you know, extending families as children grow into adults. And it's, it's proven that, you know, if you make the time in those first 18, you're going to have more time with them. If you don't, then it, it can be an isolating effect. And I've seen that with a lot of families, John. So it's a simple math equation. You know, you're talking about your oldest now at six. I know what goes through your head right now. Wow, 12 summers left. That doesn't sound like much. And it doesn't, <laughs> right? And, and, and It sounds like a lot and not a lot at the same time. It is. is. kind of the mind trick, isn't it? It is. And it just, all this is, is a positive motivation for real stats to put intentional time on the people you love and care about the most. Because if you, if not, Every year will go by and all of a sudden, especially for our entrepreneurs out there, it's like, whoosh, man, it's October and I don't, I feel like I've, I've missed the whole year with my family. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that one comment. It's, it's quite shocking. And to me, it's, I don't know whether it's different or the same as it used to be. We have these devices, of course, that are meant to make our lives easier, but they've just produced different problems. I, I think about my dad. And my dad worked really hard. I'm the youngest of four. So busy mm -hmm. household, of course. Yeah. And my dad worked really hard and traveled. But when he was home, he was home. Yeah. Now, he was not home a lot. He was in Montreal and Toronto, right? So he was in Montreal once a week for a lot of my childhood. And, and you know, he left to exercise in the mornings, which I wish he was there for breakfast with us. But now I realize he was doing that for us not for yeah. himself because now he's on the floor at 77 years old with his grandkids. His grandkids. Yeah. I love it. And, and so he was doing that for us, but I wish that he was around, but the difference was that when he was home, he was home. Yeah. There was a real seem like that anymore. Does it No, the separation has died. And that's one of the things where it's, it's a little bit about the great entrepreneurial lie. Oh, well you work on your terms, 
but then all of a sudden you're available in every space nook and cranny <laughs> and you know, you're really on your terms then you're on everyone else's if you never shut off and you know one of the yeah. one of the most important principles of our book john is this principle of intermittent tech fasting okay tell me about that well you, I, I, mean, love, I love that you say that to me as a fitness guy <laughs> like yeah well, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm thinking choir here with you and 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 from what you've taught me but it's you know, when you're when you're doing intermittent fasting, you're not giving up eating, right? I'm, you're you're just being being disciplined. You're going to eat between this time and this time, and why? Because you've seen that it has, you know, muscle and fat loss and organ revitalization, all, all these different things that we've we've seen better for longevity. That's what I believe. The same thing with intermittent tech fasting. I'm not mm -hmm. telling you you have to move to a survival ranch in Western Canada with 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 no access to any form of electronics what i'm saying is you have to have times of complete and total unavailability right. and i do this unavailability john tonight is uh is date night with my wife my phone yeah. is no longer invited these these board meetings i do with my children every quarter they're not invited um every day after work i turn off my phone now and mm -hmm. uh and i can give you a powerful story of why everyone needs intermittent tech fasting yeah so i come it. home come home and maggie's eight now so she's about five come home from work and I normally will leave my phone in the computer bag or, you know, in the car, in the cup holder, broke my own rule. I get out of the car, it's going to turn off my phone and, uh, and Maggie's standing there and she's ready to go on the trampoline job. You know, we love our trampolines. So she's like, daddy, let's go on the trampoline. So the I get most, on the trampoline. That's the most Florida statement anybody has ever said. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we love our trampoline and our beach. So we're either bouncing or swimming. So, um, so we're, we're, um, we're, we're going into, um, uh, the trampoline and, and in my pocket is, zzz, 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 zzz. yeah. And I feel that I hear it now. I don't even have to look, but my mind is just going in seven different directions at that time, John, seven different directions. And I pull out the phone and I was working on a real estate closing. You know, I'm a real estate investor mm -hmm. besides the family education and someone messed up a closing, a simple thing. It's 5.30 at this point. Nothing can be done. But what happens at that point, John? I'm swearing under my breath. I'm going into scenarios how to fix it. And all of a sudden, I come consciously to the situation where I'm at. And there's my little five-year-old daughter staring at me. Yeah. You know, she's got this almost quiver lip, you know, that sad quiver lip. And, and, and I look at her like, oh, my gosh, what's wrong? And she goes, Daddy, why are you, why are you so mad at me? And it was like, wow. I mean, that was like slow down of all universes. And it made me realize none of us, even oh, I'm supposed to be the family guy who, you know, I, none of us are that good, especially if entrepreneurship is hard. When we're in the trenches, we're in the trenches and we don't even realize that we, 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 if, if we're not completely shut off now, I had left the trampoline. I'm in work world. My poor daughter thinks I'm mad at her. I'm swearing under my breath about work and she can't tell the difference. And that was a huge reminder to me. And I still, I'm not perfect at this, but way better. I don't want those interruptions. There was nothing I could have done anyway. Anything could have waited another hour or two, John. And that's what you're just saying. When your dad was home, he was home. And, and what I found is, you know, even there, there was this uh, stat, I don't know if I told you about 60 years ago, the average dinner time was, was about 90 minutes. And that okay. just sounds crazy for them. 90 minutes, what did they talk about? Well, they talked about a lot and they prepped the food and they sat down. Now, today, you know what the average mealtime is for the average American family? I mean, I, 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 I would, knowing my friends and neighbors and stuff like that, the fact that we sit down and have dinner together is an anomaly. Yeah. Well, they're, so they're, yeah. The what average do you would be like, I, if I, I mean, I would say that there wouldn't even be one. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you're <laughs> close because it's less than 12 minutes. Yeah. So we've wow. gone from 90 minutes to less than 12 minutes. And I can't help thinking because I didn't see all the parts of this study, but we're all rushing off to something. Yeah. And it's normally a text, social media thread, quick email. You know, all these things start to call upon us very quickly. And that's why I said you have to have periods of time where you're completely and totally unavailable. And mm -hmm. I like to do it with the whole family, John, now with our teens you know, if everyone's phone is off and everyone's computer's off and the TV's off, there is a different environment. There's a different engagement. Um, there's a deeper conversation. And uh, and you see the difference because if not, we're always being run over. 
if you're having a conversation or trying to have a meaningful conversation with someone and they're not fully there, well, did you really have a meaningful conversation or you're not there? I mean, how many times have we had that embarrassing moment with our kids that we are on our phone and we think we give them a, a sensible answer and it made no sense. And we're like, oh, we just multitasked with success. And, you know, we're totally kidding yeah. ourselves. So th the intermittent tech fasting is just something everyone should start incorporating into their life today. And it's such a simple idea. I mean, the same with your board meetings, which we'll talk about. And I want to get into the idea of the habits forming through repetition with those board meetings and things. We're going to get to that. But to hit on, just to like round out the idea of the intermittent tech fasting, the intermittent fasting in the fitness industry is similar. It, there's a lot of argument in the fitness world about whether a lot of the quote unquote ways that intermittent fasting works or doesn't work is true. I'm actually of the camp that all of the hormonal stuff and digestive stuff is actually, if not completely wrong, like kind of meaningless. Yeah. The biggest advantage of it is the biggest advantage of any diet, which is calorie control. If you have a large part of time of your day where you're not eating, you don't eat as much. That's literally it. Like, wow. like I don't care who you are in terms of you know how much you're going to eat in one meal if you make a rule and this is this comes down into um i can't or i don't right i can't is somebody else saying to you you can or cannot do something i don't is you taking autonomy over that decision yeah and there's a big difference between the two right when you set your own rules and you say i don't eat during this time you're taking autonomy over that decision good point and you're not eating the food and what you talked about is the same idea it's not there isn't anything magical about it other than hey structure breeds freedom yeah rigidity is a good thing black yes. and white rules are a good thing Absolutely. But they can't be things that other people force upon you. I mean, that's that's lesson number one through five of a great coach yeah. is they help you make your own plan. There's a quote that I found. I think this was written on your website. I'm not sure exactly where I found it. I should have written that down. I'm pretty sure it was on the website. But it said, sadly, we often succumb to the pressures of business and we sacrifice key time and connections with our family. While fixated on growing the business, we forget to grow the relationship with our children and our spouse. That one hit me hard. Yeah. When I read it, it's this, it, it, the business seems more present, but presence doesn't necessarily correlate to importance or purpose, does it? No, no. And, and it seems like a lot of the times with the best intentions, and again, I don't think there's a lot of malicious behavior out there. No. You know, there's a big honor to providing for our family. I mean, it is, it is a pressure that a lot of people feel, but it can all of a sudden kick into overdrive. And then it seems like our family's always getting what's just what's left over, if that makes any sense. Yeah. There's, there's two directions that I want to go here. One is kind of your approach to education and homeschooling. I have a, I have a fun story uh, that I want to bring up. The other one is the board meetings. Which do you want to tackle first? Both are great subjects you and I have chatted in depth on. So you tell me, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> Let's talk about homeschooling a little bit first. Because what I love about your approach, so we don't, we don't homeschool. But I do ascribe to a lot of your philosophy of, hey, everything is education and trying to identify teaching moments yeah, over the course of the day when you're out and about is important. So there's a story that you told that I've retold multiple times. I don't know whether you remember this. I don't know if I'm going to tell it wrong, but you can tell me you with your family, you and Jamie, your wife, uh, were at a Walmart with your family and you saw a homeless person who was outside and they asked if they, they asked for money, but they didn't just ask for money. They asked for money specifically because they wanted to buy a sleeping bag. Uh -huh. And your family went in and I, as far as I remember the story, you went in and you bought him a blanket. Yeah. But then after, so that's 
wonderful, of course, but then afterwards you use that as a lesson to your kids of the importance of being specific with what you're asking for. Like this person went to Walmart and asked very specifically about the thing that they needed. And as yeah. a result, they got exactly what they needed. Exactly. Yep. Did I make I up that story? <laughs> Is that something that actually opened up some great conversations about, <laughs> well, why wouldn't you just give them the money? And I said, well, yeah. that, that can be a dangerous thing as you'll find in, in as you learn about financial intelligence and, and addiction. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to accelerate worse habits. Now, if it wants to keep warm, we can help with that. And we talked about service and contribution, but yeah, the specifics are super important. Um, and I think one of the issues I had with school was we weren't really encouraged to ask questions. We yeah. were told to take commands, at least where I went. And, uh, and that wasn't good for an ADD kid who had a hard time sitting in his seat. Um, right. So today for us, for education, so, you know, it's funny with, we do use homeschooling, um, but we also use Jamie Rand Montessori and Waldorf schools. So we're very alternative. And the great thing I found about homeschooling, John, I think I've joked with you before, like it, when people talk about homeschooling, they're like, well, it's like going into the mafia. You know what I mean? Once you're in, you're in, you know, you can't, you're, you know, you're, you're in this, this homeschool mob, the- mafia, you, know, you can't get out, you're taking a blood oath. It, it's not true. And it's like, well, people are like, I thought I might try homeschooling for a semester or a year. And I say, it's not the mob. You can get in and get out. You know, if you ever want to try it, it's there for you. And and you can do a blend. We've had kids in 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 different schools and homeschooled and um, and we used a blend. But for us, I think that a lot of families are starting to incorporate more of their values at earlier ages, John. And for us as a family, we really like adventure. And the normal school system didn't really um, encourage or or set a, a stage for adventure. And so that was one of the reasons we wanted to homeschool. And our kids wanted to homeschool. And our older boys who are now, they graduated high school early. They both have their own businesses. They had the choice to go to normal high school. They said, no, nah, I'd rather you know, get it done. We, we had a, they had a, a relative a little older than them who they watched. She went through homeschooling and she would finish in about three days a week and get out about two to three months earlier than everyone else. Right. And so nice. for me with entrepreneurship where you and I could, I mean, I love reading your stuff, how, how you've built your fitness business. Like you couldn't have done that trying to one-on-one train everyone all the time. I mean, you'd be run ragged in, into the ground by now. Sure. So I was really happy. My son saw that lesson through homeschooling and go, gosh, you know, I want to have time to go out and fish and surf and work out and, and take adventures. I have this choice or this choice. And I like that this can be done in three days a week and with three months less in the year to do it. That was kind of the thing. So we let them make their own decision. Let's talk about fishing. Let's talk about commercial fishing with your son. Yeah. So tell me know, about how that came about. So as you know, in our board meeting, it's all about, and if you heard just before, um, so I'm in my home office right now, our little studio, and you heard me, I just knocked on the window because he's he's repairing something on his boat. And I was like, hey, I'm on a podcast, stop. <laughs> so, so it's very, very real time right now. Um, yeah. So, but on the board meetings, I always encourage John, we always say, I want my kids to, I want to understand their gifts and talents and, and interests and support them. Well, that's why I always let them plan the days. You know, when we go on these quarterly board meetings, hey, what do you want to do today? You plan the adventure, we'll go all in. Um, he loved to fish. We went fishing so many times on his on his board meetings, I can't even tell you. And uh, and he was good. He was really good. He had a talent for it. So I always tell my kids, if they ever came to me and said, what do you think I should do when I grow up? I said, don't worry about what I want. What, what do you want? That's what mm-hmm. matters. That's where the creativity steps in. And he just started to play with his idea. Could I have my own charter fishing business? Could I be a professional fisherman? Well, from our family retreats, we had two people that had young guys who, that was there with their parents who had built successful charter fishing businesses. He went down and mentored with them in the Keys. Um, you know, we went in that on- That was with, the key, wasn't it? That, that uh, Florida Keys. Yeah, that was having the mentor down there was absolutely- Yeah, and you guys just went down as a family and- 
met them and learned not just like, oh, you like fishing. Like, hey, let's let's meet some people who are in the business of fishing. Exactly. Like, let's go there and talk to them. And I think it was called, um, I think you and I have talked, I think it's called like the Ben Franklin approach. Ben Franklin was big about, um, not, it wasn't mentorships, apprenticeships, apprenticeships. So he okay. says, you really want to learn something, you'd go to the blacksmith, you'd go to the, the, the newspaper guy, you'd go to, so that's exactly what he did. And he said, let's test this. Maybe you won't like it. And that's okay. Right. But he did. And he started to, um, what's, what's the saying, you know, the faster you can go in a certain area, the, the, the further you go. Like, I think you're, you have a real gift for what you share with, with fitness. And when you start to learn new things, it just accelerates more quickly if that if you're if you're within your genius right let me let me give you this example there was a, a study done about speed readers there were kids that were reading at like let's say it was, I think it was like 50 words a minute there were kids who were at like 300 words a minute and they went <laughs> yeah. into this, this speed reading class and the speed readers that were slow who were at 50 words a minute they took the class they improved to like 180 words a minute right so monster improvement Mm -hmm. The kids who had 300,000 words a minute went up to like 2000 words a minute because right. they were already accelerating their talent that they yeah. already kind of had. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I watched Alden do that and we just gave him the space and everything's an experiment. And we let our kids experiment. He had chicken egg businesses and shoe design. I remember that. I remember yeah. you talking about measuring the cost of goods for that. Yeah. So, and he learned all these fun. things. But the one that stuck, like, one, hey, if you're going to do chickens and eggs, if you're going to do a business, like, we're going to calculate this stuff. And we did that with Calvin. He wanted to do a lemonade oh, really? thing. Oh, nice. And, and so we just we said, okay, cool. Like, we'll we'll pay for it. I mean, you're six. Like, we'll pay for it. But let's actually calculate it to see, hey, are, are we actually making money on this or not? Yeah, yeah, I love this. And this and is just it out. Yeah, and you start experimenting young, John. It becomes normal. Yeah. What I see is so many people, you don't have the money talk with their kids until they're like 27 and already gone through their first blowout of overspending and this and that and they're rescuing them. And, you know, we started real young. And then at the age of about 15, 16, Jamie and I actually sit down and share all of our financials with our teens. Now, some people think that's crazy, but if we want our kids to have financial responsibility, but we're going to hide all the money facts from them, how does that add up? How do they ever, you know, develop it then? And I, I let them know this is what we've done. This is what I did right. This is what I did wrong. You know, yeah, we've done pretty well, um, but there's no guarantee you're going to get this. I will set up opportunities for you that I didn't have, but I won't do the push-ups for you. You know, my old Jack LaLanne favorite. You know, yeah, I'm not, course. I'm not here to do my put the push-ups for you. You know, but uh, <laughs> you know, we have certain we put core values around our money, John you know, certain things of, of respect, appreciation, sobriety. So sobriety and addiction are an easy one. Like I always tell my kids, look, I will always love you. I'll be there to support you. If you decide to take a road of addiction, um, I'll be there for you, but, but don't expect me to fund your addiction. I don't fund addiction. I won't do that. I love you too much. Um, you know, we'll try to get you sober, but I would never actively support you by giving you an apartment, giving you a car, giving you an ATM card and you being able to me providing the means to be a functioning addict. I just won't do that if that makes sense. Um, so that was a big part of our education as well uh, in our own matrix, learning about money at a very early age. I want to take it back to that example with the speed reading. Okay. Because I think this idea of experimentation and a rapid experimentation. So, the background to what we're doing here is I have a book that actually the proposal is being sent to editors right now. It's called The Obvious Choice, and it's 13 obvious yet non-obvious lessons for building a business, timely, timeless lessons. And one of the tenets of it, this isn't the entire lesson, but this is part of one of the lessons, is this idea that you really can't do too many things. Maybe two, maybe three, probably one. Right. And that comes down to the job that you choose to do, but also how you choose to market or promote yourself. Yeah. And there are very few objectively best ways to do something. There's a lot of lowercase G E good enough ways. Yeah. But you can't do all of them. So you've got to decide which is best for you. And a big component of that, I believe, is that 
our natural skills, attributes, passions, energies. Basically, anybody with the right amount of efforts and the study seems to back that up can go from bad to good in just about anything. But there's only a few things where you can really go from good to great. Yeah, I agree. And it's a matter of finding out, figuring out what that is for you. And I, a large part of your education, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like that you work with your kids is like, hey, let's rapidly test this stuff. Let's let you dictate it, number one. But then let's rapidly test this stuff. Yeah. And figure out, right, by going yes to experts and visiting these commercial fishermen and by measuring the cogs, the cost of goods in our uh, chicken egg farm coop at our place. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's wonderful. As you know, it's been inspirational to me. And we do do uh, a, I can't remember what you called it, a split education. So we go away for the winters and yeah. we unenroll. Calvin is in a public school here in okay. Toronto. Uh, and we unenroll them for three or four months in the winter and we take them with us. And then we re-enroll him back in when we get back in the spring and he finishes the school year there. And it doesn't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't miss a beat. People, the amount of questions, every time... This will be our 11th winter in a row going away, right? Every single time I talk about where we're going, I get the same questions. Oh, what do you do for school? Yeah. Are we homeschool so or we find a little school there. Like he's like, he doesn't speak Spanish, but he went to a Spanish school in Mexico <laughs> for three months and he was great. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, love it. I love it. And a lot of people, we just, we take false no's or, or the famous, you can't do that. You know, when you were like, hey, I'm going to I'm I want to go deeper into the fitness industry. And the only way I can do that and help more people is not to do one on one training. Um, I need to broaden my thing. And there were probably people who said you can't do that. When yeah. when we when I first started doing real estate deals, people said, you're not even a realtor. You can't do real estate deals. You can't do that. And I'm going, there's always this false. You can't do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen that with school. Like, well, you can't do that with your kids. Pull them in and out and saying, well, actually you can, and there's ways to do it. And there's also ways to explain it. And for our job requirements, we need to be down in Costa Rica a few months out of the year. So our family's coming with us, you know, right. and if our kids are in normal school, there's, there's a way to do it. So I always ask people, you know, how true is the, you can't do that when people say it to you, it's something you always got to yeah. be tested. There's a, there's a filter that a friend of mine passed on to me. It's a cognitive filter. He calls it the fog filter which is, is what you're saying a fact, an opinion, or a guess? Oh, I love that. That's good. And it's just a quick check yourself before you wreck yourself. What are we working with here? It doesn't mean that it's necessarily right or wrong or good or bad. Yeah. It's just a very quick way to take a step back and say, all right, what's, what's going on here? What are we talking about? What are we dealing with? Okay, yeah. now that we understand which bucket to put this thing in, where do we go from here? Yeah. Doesn't mean we do or we don't do. Yeah. It's just, how do we make a better decision about it? Okay, let's get into the board meetings. Yeah, so so the best thing about our, Tell me what it is. our strategy is you can put it on the back of a paper napkin and the book is easy to read. Yeah. Uh, but the basics of this is, we always tried to put our children in a position where they were our most important clients, team members, investors, whatever you want to call them from your, your business entrepreneurial mindset. So I spend a day, a quarter with each one of my children. Yep. And I do it one on one. The one to one principle is key, doing intermittent tech fasting and allowing them to plan the day and going all in, you know, and at the end having some meaningful conversation. That is the accidental movement we started john you know, that is the accidental <laughs> movement it seems so oversimplistic and so uh, just almost like it didn't have enough juice but then when yeah. we started to see the results from i mean i hear stories from you and so many others it it warrants a lot of attention because because of the results and because it's giving priority to the people we all want to give priority to. And we wish we had gotten, like you said, with your dad, I love my dad. I never got that time being a family of five that struggled with money. I, I didn't have these days. 
And now that he's passed on, what would I do for those days? Oh man, what size of a check would I write for that those days? I mean, I don't even know if you can you can put enough. How much is in your bank account? Is the question. Yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, and and so as you said, structure doesn't kill our our liveliness or our spirit. It actually supports us. Yeah. So scheduling these every quarter with my children, it's it's a marker. It's a testament. It is a rejuvenation. And, and, and we, we look forward to the next one and we reflect off the last one. And these days have changed, changed the lives. I mean, you know, with our son who I was just, here he is out there, you know, after doing a charter this morning, you know, fixing something on his boat, you know, he, he's a grown man of 20 now. When I came into his life at seven, you know, cause I adopted my two oldest boys, you know, our story about Jamie was an awful marriage. She married a, a high school boyfriend right out of college, ended up being extremely uh, addictive and, and abusive. And she stood up for herself, got out. And when I met her a few years later, she had full custody of these two beautiful little boys who then down the road asked me to adopt them. Um, and we hit it off right away. But you know, John, when I came into Alden's life, he really struggled. He had, mm -hmm. uh, he, he was failing at school. He uh, was put on the spectrum for autism and he suffered from night terrors every night. Um, yeah. Within a year Jeez. of these days together, John, they were gone. All of those retracted the diagnosis of autism, no more night terrors, most improved student in the third grade. And it just shows that, you know, there's a time and a place for therapy and medication. That's not what got us there. It was just some quality time together where he felt self safe, safe and appreciated having some fun, some deeper conversation he had never been able to have at that level between a father figure and a son. And, um, and it made all the difference. And that's mm -hmm. why I started telling this story, you know, and I've heard so many more stories of, of success built around these simple one day a quarter, you know, uh, rhythms that again, they're not going to make you feel cheap or, or get bored of like, I've been doing these now for 13 years yeah. with my older boys. And they're like, we still look forward to them. Yeah. And that's, you know, most teens might not want to talk like that, but um, I think if you start to do them for the right reason, you can see the same answer. The, the, the ritualistic aspect of it. I think yeah. it's very important. So let me just roll through. This is directly from your book. This is mine. But let me just roll through like the quote unquote rules because they're rules, but they're not really rules. And I'll tell they're you guidelines. also how yeah. they're guidelines, right? And you make it work for yourself. So I've been looking forward to doing this forever, but I had to wait till my son was old enough to do this. I mean, we have time together, of course, when he was a baby and when he was a toddler, but he couldn't really dictate the activity uh, yeah, to yeah. the extent that he can now. So the guidelines are uh, four uninterrupted hours minimum, right? One on one with your child and one on one with one child. Just one child. So if you no... have multiple children, yeah, one at a time. And no spouses. no spouses. No spouses. No best friends. Nothing. You, you, yeah. the, the one to one principle puts the magnifying glass on that one relationship in a positive way, which is so key. So number three is no electronics, which we've spoken about a bit before. Yeah. And I want to give a couple tactical ways to have no, uh, the, the issue that I had, so I'll get into this really, really quick. The issue that I had is, you know, we spend these winters away and we've been all over the world, right? We lived everywhere from Montenegro, Serbia, Albania, to Greece, to Mexico, Costa Rica a few times, and Osara, and, uh, and, and everywhere in between. The issue that I have is your phone is now your camera right, is now your, your text messaging to make sure you're safe is whatever. And I found that I was always, I wanted to retain the memories. So I would take out my phone to, you know, click, take a picture. The minute you got your phone in your hand, a goddamn thing has been engineered to be so yeah. addictive yeah. Yeah. that now I'm thinking about it. Now I'm cued into it. What we started to do actually, Jim, was wherever we went, we hired a local photographer to do a photo shoot. Interesting. For two to three hours, one time over the course of the trip, all you really need are 20 to 30, like great photos in a place. Yeah, it's true. So we don't have, you know, we lived in Montenegro for three months. We don't have any photos of Montenegro other than the photo shoot that we did there. And we hired a Montenegrin photographer, right? For whatever it is, like 200 euros, like, like nothing. And he probably captured some pretty cool moments to, and, to help. And she knew there. exactly where to go. She knew the right lighting. Yeah. And, and so some of the photographers are better than others and whatever. But every season, 
we hire somebody. So we've been back to Sayuli to Mexico now a number of times. And we hire a different photographer each time. We did a beach one. We did a town one. We did a jungle one. And what's cool about that is it's just a, a very tactical way to get the, to overcome that idea of, hey, I want to remember this moment where we are in this time I agree. without feeling like I need to snap pictures all the time. And it, it's super cheap. Um, and then and then number four, your number, your fourth rule is do a fun activity of the child's choosing followed by focused reflection. Now, I want to ask you about the focused reflection. But first, the child's choosing. Yeah. So, so Calvin might not right now have any interest in a symposium on intermittent tech, uh, intermittent fasting for, for muscle strength. <laughs> but for you, that sounds great. And I'm like, oh, it God, does I'm not sound that. great to me. That's so yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let, let's do another one. So I, I love, I, surfing. Get, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I love surfing. My son, all, like I said, he loves fishing. I'll surf every time over fishing. I like fishing, but I'd much rather surf. But I never tried to say, hey, let's go surfing. You know, I never tried to say, or for, for all our sports fans out there, what if your son or daughter has no interest in the sports team you love, but you say, all right, we're going to do a board meeting. Let's go to the, you know, the Maple Leafs game. And you drag them along. They're not really into the hockey game. And you feel proud and give yourself a little punch to the arm like, yeah, we bonded. Right. The bonding goes so much further if you go all in on what they want to do. And we're always about, I want to start to understand their gifts and talents. I can tell now after doing these for so many years, they start as they get the chance to take ownership and plan a day, those are going to start to come to the surface. And there's going to be way more ownership and buy-in if you know, you're know you not that pushy entrepreneur like me who would try to plan the day like, I think this is what you'd want to do. I think this would be great. Mm. Let them come up with it. You know, if I hadn't, I can tell you, I don't know if my son would have found a successful career so early. You know, I was like, yeah. gosh, 20, I was completely clueless. So, so that's what it's about. And focus reflection, John, it sounds so scary. Well, so let's let's go back. Let's go back to that okay. for a moment. Because for anybody who's a, a father or mother of a young child like mine, I still found that difficult with Calvin. So Calvin was five and a half, right, when we did the first one. And I still found that difficult. You know, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't I don't know. Like we were living in Mexico at the time. Okay. And so he didn't I tried to let him lead it. Then what we instead did, and I, I'm going to try to let him lead like the next one, mm-hmm. but what we actually did was a little bit different, which is why I like the idea of the guidelines, which was, hey, let's go to Oaxaca City. So we were living in Sayulita, which is like 45 minutes north of Puerto Vallarta. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right, let's go down to Oaxaca City. And I saw, you know how I sold him on it? I was like, this is where chocolate comes from. <laughs> there you go. All right. all right, let's go to Oaxaca City. And then part of his homeschooling, part of his part of his education was researching stuff to do in Oaxaca City right and so then he said I really want to go to caves and I want to see a bat it's like all right we saw a bat in some caves outside of Oaxaca City you know and and so that was a nice way for if anybody's in the same position that I'm in where the kid particularly a little bit young isn't leading it because they just don't really know how like maybe you haven't done this before that worked really well for us you know choose a place to narrow down the idea and then they can sit down and actually look up Absolutely. and begin to research like hey what is some, what is some yeah. stuff to do there? and observation helps with that john observe your kids don't don't push your own thing like a like if i want to go surfing or a football game well like sammy he loves the alligator farm loves it okay i mean he just he's gone with his cousins he's gone and and so when he was having struggle I tried to make a recommendation of something I have observed that he's really down with. That's a good so, idea. So it was, hey, go to the alligator farm. Or another one in Costa Rica, he loves getting on the quad with me and driving around. Yes. So I'm saying, he said, I don't know. I said, well, how about we go We go just drive around in the quads and we'll stop mm-hmm. it. I named the place he likes to eat, not where I like to eat. <laughs> And we'll go see the monkeys over in that part of the forest. I'm talking about Nosara yep. now, so you know it well. Oh, I know it well. Alice and I would get on a quad and go four days up the coast and just yeah. stay in stay in any place we find. So, that so was I, that was BC. I call it I call it BC before Calvin. Uh, well, before, <laughs> <laughs> well, now Calvin's gonna be ready to be sitting on the front of that quad with yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. That's what that's what Sammy loves. 
So be ob- be observant. Yeah. Take note of things that they're saying they really like and maybe go back to that, like the Pirate Museum. Oh, can we go there? Can we go there? And then when it's time, if they didn't have something, I said, Maggie, do you want to do you want to go to the Pirate Museum this time? Oh, my gosh. Yes, that's right. I want right. to do that. So, you know, that's cool. Those are good mental notes. And I know I know one of the things that you do. I know we're running out of time, so I want to get into the focused reflection. But I know one of the things that you do also is like you'll keep a list. Right. Yeah. As they say stuff, yeah. you'll kind of keep a running list and you'll say, hey, you know. Do you have anything else that you want to do? Okay, cool. Here's all of the things that you've said over the last couple months. Why don't you choose from here? Uh, which, which I think is great. That idea of just like observing your child, like what do they do is so special. So, so special. Talk to me about focused reflection. Yeah. So focus. How do we reflection. do that? So, well, all we're using here on this, on this board meeting strategy, this, you know, call it what you want. Mom, daughter day, mom, son, whatever. I don't care what you call it, but this format works. <laughs> and a fun activity with focus reflection is a short definition for experiential education. That's what experiential education is. So you're doing something inspiring together and then spending time to talk about it afterwards to open up, clarify values, lessons. And so all, all of focus reflection is a time period where you have some conversation after the guard has gone down, you're decompressed, you've had a good time together on their terms, yeah. probably a meal. And, and this is a perfect opportunity. You can ask, hey, what was your part, favorite part of the day? Yeah. yeah. Why? And just that one question is a starting point. What was your favorite part of today? Why? Oh, that's great. And then they're going to probably ask you. And let me tell you, this is the time, John, where we're now you know, over a decade in where I've been man enough to either offer a sincere compliment or a genuine apology. You know, like, hey, I was pretty short last week. Uh, I'd seem like I was grumpy kind of walking around. That's not fair to you. It wasn't, you know, I, I just want to apologize, you know, and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you've really been going all out to play with your, your little brother and sister, you know, with this sword game and the jump over the stick in the pool game. Like, that just, that's so invigorating to watch. So thank you for being such a good big brother. It's just, this is the time where we can give them something to live up to or, or apologize. Cause a lot of entrepreneurs, we think we're immune from apology and we're not. And one of the best ways I found to bond is to admit when I'm wrong, when I've been short, when I've been unpresent, when, you know, all those things. So, um, so th- that is an absolute key time. And, and what is not a focus reflection, John, is don't start lecturing. If you're going to get this magic day with your young ones like Calvin, who's probably easier, but a teen might be a little more hesitant to go on these days with you. You finally get them there and you ruin the moment by trying to list off 50 lectures of ways they need to improve their lives and be better. You've just cheated yourself out of a lot of memory makers in the future. This isn't a le- this is not a lecture time. Keep the lectures for another time. This is a connection time and an engaging time. And, um, and that conversation, sometimes, John, on one of these on these four hour uh, days, it might last uh, four minutes. But what I said was really potent or it might last 45 minutes, an hour and a half of deep conversation. But sometimes even on those four minute days, I said exactly what they needed to hear. Or at least I believe I did. That's what's been fed back to me. And that's just enough. Well, Jim. One of the things that I have always struggled with have always tried to work on is this triad call it the golden triad of balancing call it money business right family and health yeah and figuring out how to make sure all the lines of the triangle stay in place and that structure stay as strong as it has been has always been a challenge. And when I came across you and your work and your wife, and we had more conversations, uh, it, 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 it was the missing piece. Uh me. So I can't thank you enough. This has been a joy. Uh, personally, I hope other people benefit as well. And, uh, yeah, man, I appreciate you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. You too, bud. Look forward to many more conversations. Absolutely.